Good morning. Well, I think the, uh, I've, I've just got a number of things like converging in my mind at the same time and uh, hardly know kind of what road to go down. But maybe, maybe the first thing I want to say as I stand here is how, how grateful I am just for the opportunity to, to be with you this morning studying this topic. Um, thank you for your investment of time. We all lead very busy lives, don't we? And, uh, and Saturday morning is kind of, it's, it's the sweet spot of the weekend, isn't it? And, and you're kind of giving that up and investing that in God, his word, your marriage. And I'm, I'm grateful to be, I'm, I'm really grateful to be a part of that. Also, I want to thank Scott. I want to thank the leaders here at Doxa, at the other pastors that might be in the room. Thanks for your vision to invest in marriages. I mean, it, what, what a statement of love and foresight that you've got men, that you've got guys that are leading and they're thinking, okay, how can we do this? How can we care for the people in a more effective way coming out of a pandemic it, with respect to their marriages? So I want to thank them and recognize them and, and thank God for their heart for your marriage. Yeah. So... Scott mentioned that there was a book entitled I Still Do, which was a sequel to a, a book that I wrote called When Sinners Say I Do. The material that we're going to be going through this morning is drawn from I Still Do. There's, there's going to be two sessions. The first session, we're going to talk about the p- sin, the subject of sin as it relates to marriage, so the problem of marriage. And then the second session, we're going to talk about the significance of, of mercy in marriage. Now, when I do these things and and outside of these things, people often ask me, you know, what what kind of marriage events do you do? You know, what are they all about? Is it romance? Is it communication, conflict resolution? What's, you know, what's it all about? And I I typically say something like, well, yes and and no. Um, The goal of this material is to kind of start further upstream because what I'm endeavoring to do is I'm endeavoring to put things first First things first within, <laughs> within the marriage. I, I remember one time I, I was getting dressed in the door. I woke up early one morning, didn't want to wake up Kim, so she's sleeping. It's dark out. I get dressed in the dark. I came down, flipped on the light. I look in the mirror, and, and you know, it's like my entire body looks, I don't know, crooked, it, it, like, like, the, like my shirt just kind of crawled out of the dresser and attacked me. And it's just like hanging off of me. And I look, I look closer into the mirror. And the top button of my shirt was buttoned incorrectly. Have you ever done that? Yeah. You know, you just button the wrong button. And, and you're kind of trying to figure out. And the rest of it is just out of line. You know, you just look like you're, you're out of line. So the design of this session is to, is to button the right button first. And the right button and the first button is the gospel. And you will be amazed if you understand the gospel, how the other button, the button of romance, the button of conflict resolution, the button of communication, how those tend to align once we get the gospel. So we're going to begin in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12 through 17. I'd I'd like to read that to you. By the way, I'm... Kim is sorry, and I am so sorry that she is unable to join us for this weekend. She's at home in Southwest Florida. She's watching our our grandson. But but Kim, if she were here, would be the first to say that that writing a book on marriage does not make one an expert on marriage. We know what it's like to be up late seeking to resolve a conflict over something, typically over something, something stupid that I might have said. I mean, we've had, we've had plenty of date nights that didn't end the way date nights are supposed to end. You know what I mean by that? We've had plenty of date nights that have ended in, in, you know, in the wrong direction. And we know what it's like to wonder, can good really even come out of this? Will we ever move on? Have you ever thought that? Will we ever move on? And, and, and God has used, God has met us through some of the very things we're going to talk about 
in these passages and in the second session as well this morning. So I'm excited to read them and I'm excited to jump into 1 Timothy chapter 1 beginning in verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Verse 17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Actually, let's just join our prayer to Paul's prayer. Lord, I pray that you would be honored, that you would be glorified as we're together this morning, not only in our study of your word, but in our application of your word to our marriages. And you, Heavenly Father, by the Holy Spirit, would grant us insight and help us to understand how to take something of what you give us here and apply it outside of these walls in our marriage. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I was married only about two years after I became a Christian, which means that Kim got a very raw version of my Christianity. And I remember us having one of our first conflicts. Now, I don't remember the specifics. I mean, you get that, don't you? We have these conflicts. We don't remember the specifics. Uh, you remember no details. Just that sense that, that you were remarkably right. Do you have that feeling when you're in a conflict with your spouse? I am astonishingly right here. I mean, it's, it's amazing. The angels are certainly standing up, applauding me. They're up there. They're they're marveling, and, and, and just that sense, you know, you bring that urgency where your, your spouse's very salvation hangs on them getting the point that you're making. <laughs> and it was bothering me because Kim honestly was saying some things that were agitating me, and I, I, could, I could feel it. I knew my, the blood was churning, and, and my heart was pounding, and I, I knew that if I didn't say something quickly, the the earth could tilt off of its axis and go hurtling into space. I mean, that was the kind of, of, of burden and significance I was, I was bringing to this conflict. And then it happened, you know, as, as it always happened. I spoke, okay? <laughs> In an effort to kind of skillfully identify the essence of the problem, I exclaimed, like very matter-of-factly, I said, oh, this is so embarrassing. I said, I said, Kim, please stop talking. I said, you're making me angry and you're making me sin. Yeah, I know, I know, it's embarrassing, it is. But you know what, you've done it too, so don't, <laughs> don't be looking at me like that. And by the way, guys, if you're here and you're newly married, let me just encourage you to like um, explore other causes for your behavior apart from your new bride, <laughs> because I'm returning to say that one doesn't work. That one does not work. But here's the thing. It made perfect sense to me, because prior to marriage, I was growing daily more Christ-like. I mean, 
at least I was to me, it wasn't as clearly evident to other people, but it was clearly evident to me. Why? Because in my thinking, and this is really important, sin was becoming a thing of the past. Oh, it was, it was certainly an issue before conversion. But now I was a Christian. And the old was passing away. Behold, new things have come. And sin was, I, I viewed sin as kind of like this old school thing. And then I got married to somebody who clearly had sin issues. <laughs> and and my, my hopes for like the sinless life were being flushed on the toilet. And, and I didn't know what to do with that, honestly. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed the question of, is my spouse a sinner? It's so much easier to answer than the question, am I a sinner? Here's the point I want to make. The question, am I a sinner, was not hard for Paul to answer. In fact, you might be surprised at how he answers. So let's just drop back into 1 Timothy where we find Paul writing 1 Timothy from Macedonia to address the Ephesians. And uh, just a point or two on context, the, these false teachers have, have worked their way, they've kind of insinuated their way into the church, and they have begun to teach what he calls in verse 3, different doctrines. And the effect is described, and we didn't read this earlier, but it's described very specifically in, in verse 6 where he says, some have wandered into vain speculation. He goes on to say in verse 7, they want to be teachers of the law, but here's what they don't understand. Here's what they completely miss, that the law reveals something about us. The law reveals that we are sinners. Actually, just, just look at verse 9 for a second. The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners and for the unholy and the profane. So, I mean, you know, <clears throat> what a shocker. The false teachers have lost the sinfulness of sin. And the challenge with that is when you lose sin, you eliminate the need for a savior. When you lose sin, you obliterate the need for a sacrifice for yourself. And so Paul wants them to see something, something that he says is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. And this is it. This is what he delivers to them, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, not those who are basically good. Christ Jesus came into the world to save, not, not the enlightened or the religious. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, here's, here's where I'm going with this. For Paul, there was always this link between the bad news and the good news. There was always a connection between the two. That to truly exalt in the good news and to truly understand the good news, you had to comprehend what made the bad news so bad. Or to put it in the words of one of my favorite Puritans, Thomas Watson, who once said, till sin be bitter... Christ will not be sweet. And I would suggest that not only is it till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet, but marriage will not be sweet either till sin be bitter. And so here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells us his, his story. He, he is, according to verse 16, an example to those who would, were to believe in him for eternal life. So I want to spend the remainder of the time in this first session, just looking at the link between Paul's story and our marriage. And I want to do that by exploring two statements. Two statements that ultimately transform how we view our marriage. And here's statement number one. Statement number one is, I am my own biggest problem. Let's drop back into verse 13. Paul says, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. Let, let's just stop for a second. See, Paul, Paul looks at sin in two different ways to verify this idea that I am my own biggest, biggest problem. He looks at sin as something he used to do in the past. 
And that's where in verse 13, he says, hey, guys, I, I got to be honest with you. Um, formerly, I was, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent opponent. See, see for Paul, he, Paul is saying, yeah, I, I was a sinner. And, and by the way, Paul's past is, is pretty serious. And we can tend to see Paul as, I don't know, like, like indirectly involved in the really bad stuff that was happening to the Christians back then. You know, Acts chapter 7, he's, Stephen is being stoned, and he's kind of just chilling out on the side, holding the coats, and just thinking, yeah, this is really wild. But that's not how Paul represents himself in the New Testament. This man wanted an inquisition. That's what he wanted. His cause was to, to discredit Christianity and, and, and collapse Christ. He was a brutal, bloody, religious predator. That's who Paul was. But the call of God was irresistible on his life. It overruled his will. It arrested him for the purposes of God. And it actually appointed him to represent the very thing he once, once, once sought to destroy. But here's the thing I want you to plug into here, because we're, we're going to your marriage, but I want to establish like a foundation first. Have you ever noticed that Paul never forgot who he was? Paul remembered how he lived, and it was a point of reference for him in how he thought about the grace of God. In fact, Paul would reflect back on the fact that he was a persecutor, he was an insolent opponent, and somehow that didn't condemn him. That didn't send him hurtling down the road to shame. There was something about the way Paul thought about the past where the bitterness of those memories made Christ sweet. And so... What we're doing is we're exploring the statement of, I am my own biggest problem. And we're recognizing when Paul thought about his sinfulness, he thought about first that he was a sinner. But then there's a, a second kind of way that Paul thought about sin as well, and that is that he still is a sinner. Listen to him describe himself in verse 15. The saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Now, where does your mind go when you hear Paul say that? I mean, does that just strike you as, I don't know, exaggeration or false modesty? Are, are, we, are we working with a, a low ego here, a low sense of self-respect? After all, this guy was, was the apostle to the Gentiles. This guy was the writer of Scripture. He'd been to the third heaven. And, and what's more is Paul is on the back end of his life. So the person who's making these statements is a mature, seasoned, godly, powerful witness of Jesus Christ. And yet somehow his godliness led him to a deeper grasp of his sinfulness. And his sinfulness then sparked a fresh gratitude for what Christ accomplished for him. So for Paul to say of whom I am the foremost regarding his sinfulness was, act, was not a sign of immaturity or a, a lack of personal and spiritual health, but it was a sign of maturity in his life, of godliness, of, of spiritual growth, of spiritual health. And what I want to do now is I want to talk and help make the connection between how does that statement of whom I am the foremost how does that truth influence my marriage? And here's a couple of thoughts that I have for you. Number one, first, it fixes me in my marriage as the worst sinner I know. It fixes me in my marriage as the worst sinner I know. See, Paul's not saying here that he has objectively compared himself with everyone in the world and has come back crowning himself the worst of sinners. No, Paul, Paul knows that, that we are created, we are constituted in such a way that we can only ever have a front row seat to one human heart, and that is our own. And even the seat that we have to our own heart is like on the mezzanine. It's not on the cheap seats, but it's not a front row seat. 
There's a lot of distance between us and our ability to actually discern our own hearts. But for Paul, and according to this passage, the goal was to apply himself to his own heart until he was convinced that he was his own worst problem. It's the same goal for us in marriage. To apply ourselves to our own heart first until we are convinced of what Paul became convinced of, that I am my own biggest problem. See, the goal in marriage is to make this statement trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance for each of us. For every husband and wife sitting here, God wants to do a work in your life to make this statement trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance in your marriage. So let me ask you a question. Are you the worst sinner you know? Or honestly, deep down in your heart, is that the person sitting next to you? Or the teenager you left at home. I mean, be honest, you know. <laughs> See, Paul was able to say he was the foremost of sinners twice in verse 16. Do, do we say it at all? Because you know what was going on in that conflict I described at the beginning of this message? I was kind of reversing what Paul said. I was seeing Kim as the foremost of sinners. My theology back then was, I was a sinner, she is a sinner. I'm a saint, she's a sinner. <laughs> and you know why? Because I didn't see this statement as trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am. I love the way that that just turns it back around. I am the foremost. So it fixes me in my marriage as the worst sinner I know. Secondly, is it makes grace the answer to my biggest problem. It makes grace the answer to my biggest problem. So verse 13, Paul has just dropped a serious confession on what his past looked like. He, he was a bla blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was an insolent opponent. But he goes on to, in verse 13, 14, 15, and 16, he says, but... I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly and in, in, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the great faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Then he goes into verse 15 and he, he kind of comes out with that sin stuff. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners and I am the foremost. And then look where he goes in verse 16. But I received mercy. See, Paul, Paul's not afraid to kind of descend down into his heart, but what he does is he, he kind of sandwiches the pursuit of sin with the gospel. He says, I want to tell you about the grace of God. Oh, by the way, I'm the worst of sinners, but I received mercy. He's got grace and mercy on both sides of that revelation of sin. And I love this because, because Paul is not sin-centered, his, his reflections don't just stall on sin. Sin is not like a, like a parking space where he backs up his camper and he takes everything out and says, yeah, I'm going to spend the next month just camping in this place, exploring my sinfulness. So, you know, if, if you're going to reflect on an area where you feel convicted or you need to improve, then let me suggest that you follow Paul's path. You, you start with the gospel, you go down to the sin, you return to the gospel, you sandwich sin in the gospel. Paul says, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, verse 15. Oh yes, but Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, and by the way, I'm the worst, verse 15, but I receive mercy, verse 16. You sandwich sin in the gospel. You go into the, the, the smoky places of the human heart, breathing a different kind of air, breathing gospel air. Be before I was in full-time ministry, I worked in security at a, at a hospital, and we used to do these trainings with these SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus, and it was basically fire, fire rescue training,
And, and, and the whole point, well, you know, we have to run up steps and go in a room and pull out a body. The, the whole idea is that you, you're, you're capable of going into these smoky, polluted places, breathing a different kind of air. See, one of the things we discover as we, as we drop into 1 Timothy chapter 1 is we see Paul going to, to, to a, what seems like a desperate place. I'm the worst of sinners, but he's breathing this gospel air, the grace of God overflowed, but I received mercy. He's not walking away thinking all about his sinfulness. He's walking away thinking about his Savior. And, and one of the things that breathing gospel air does is it, it helps us to then perceive and celebrate the grace of God in each other. I mean, we've all noticed this over the pandemic, haven't we? That, that perceiving sin or perceiving weakness in our spouse is far easier than perceiving grace. Perceiving and identifying weaknesses in our kids is far easier than identifying grace in their life. And that's always a factor. It's been magnified throughout this pandemic. And, and what I want you to see is that, you know, it's, it's really easy, or I should say much easier to identify people's weaknesses, to identify people's failures, to identify people's sinfulness. It takes, it takes a work of grace. It takes gospel perception to identify where God is at work in their life and to be able to celebrate that, hold that up before them. I brought this quote by Sinclair Ferguson, which this is such a good quote. Listen to what he says. He says, only by seeing our sin do we come to see the need for and wonder of grace. But exposing sin is not the same thing as unveiling and applying grace. We must be familiar with and exponents of its multifaceted power and know how to apply it to a variety of spiritual conditions. Now listen to this. He says, truth to tell Exposing sin is easier than applying grace, for alas, we are more intimate with the former than we sometimes are with the latter. Therein lies our weakness. Oh, goodness. I, I can rarely read that quote without feeling indicted by it and convicted by it and needing to look to grace as a result of it. And apply this to yourself. You know, ask yourself, would my spouse say that I am better at exposing sin or at applying grace? And that one hurts a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, that one takes it in a, in a slightly different direction. Because I, I remember for us just kind of where, where our marriage started. And, and I was a mess. I mean, I... In our earlier years, I was far more perceptive to what was wrong than what was right because I was craving peace. And, and, and when you crave peace, you reach for control. You become a fixer. I was a fixer, you know. And, uh, and, and, and my problem with the fixing is that there was this kind of, there was kind of this subtle self-righteousness that created a... Uh, a high-minded legalism that saw sin as, as something that is more necessary to point out than the grace of God. And, and I saw things as this problem, you know, problems in the house or, or areas where the kids were not where they were or where I felt Kim needed this or needed that. I saw them as a problem to be fixed rather than a condition that uncovered the need for the gospel. Now, how'd you like to be married to that piece of work? Because there's, there's nothing that damages marriages quicker than being yoked to a Pharisee, than being yoked to somebody who makes much of sin. So ask yourself the question, how, how does your family experience you? How does your spouse experience you.
We want to be perceiving grace because that's an evidence that the gospel's at work in us. We're more capable and more discerning in perceiving grace than perceiving sin. Lastly, and again, we're, we're still on that first point of two statements that transform how we view marriage. And the first statement is, I am my own biggest problem. But we're looking at Paul's statement of how he said, I'm the worst of sinners. And we're making a connection between, I am the worst of sinners and how that relates to our marriage. And the last way it relates to our marriage is that it frees me from seeing myself as only sinned against. As only sinned against. Now think about something. Think about what you might consider as the greatest obstacle in your marriage right now. Whatever it might be. I mean, you remember that opening story I told. How, how th this idea that Kim made me sin. And, and it's amazing when we think, when we go to diagnose what's really going on in our heart, what's really going on in our marriage, it's amazing how often we answer that by going outside of ourselves. You know, I, I, it's, it's when my spouse does this, or the kids do that, or my boss just isn't doing this, or the, my neighbors aren't doing that. In other words, our minds immediately go to the actions and attitudes of other people. I mean, have you ever noticed that even when we talk about our stories of pain, I, I noticed that this about myself, which was very, I, it was very indicting, but it was also very instructive. When, when we talk about our stories in pain, we're never in those stories as sinners with all of our junk. You know, it's always other people that are on the stage of our life, sinners that are committing things against us or omitting things they should be doing in order to make our lives more pleasing. And us, well, well we're just this, I mean, we're just this bundle of good intentions in, the, you know, in that environment. We're on that stage. We're just praying and spreading joy wherever we go. And we're always having bad things happen to us. In other words, we have this way of understanding the status that we exist under. And that status is we live perpetually sinned against. We live perpetually sinned against. And, and one of the things that, if we're going to come to a biblical understanding of marriage and a biblical understanding of the gospel, one of the things that we have to recognize is that part of the very fiber of original sin, part of the character of original sin all the way back in Genesis 3 is to conceal itself from us and to ascribe its condition outside of our agency. It, it, it's why when God steps into the garden to hold Adam accountable, Adam says, and you know this line, it was the woman you gave me, Lord. But keep in mind, <laughs> keep in mind, yeah, yeah, it was the woman, and, but it's not just, a, there's a, both a horizontal and a vertical component here. It's, it's, oh, okay, okay, this is accountability time. Okay, well, let me just clarify what's going on here, Lord. It was the woman, and by the way, you gave her to me. So I'm exonerated in every different direction here. There's nowhere you can stand, God, where I'm indicted. Because everybody else is guilty except me. In other words, I, yeah, I may have disobeyed. I may have been some rules. I may have not done everything completely right. But I'm not here as a sinner. It's her. It's you. As for me, I live perpetually sinned against. Don't ever forget each and every day that we wake, wake up that a primary objective of sin is to remove our responsibility in the world. A primary objective of sin, of the world, of the flesh, of the devil, they, all three of those entities or impulses work over time to convert our status in the eyes of our marriage from sinner to sinned against. And of course, you've got the world completely cooperating. I mean, I just finished uh, Carl Truman's book on, on the, the, the modern therapeutic, the triumph of the modern therapeutic, and just recognizing that in effect, 
what, 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 what the modern therapeutic culture does is it's always attempting to release us of our agency. Our agency is never, never in play. It can never be, you can never get it because there's always these other factors. And what I want to say is that, that being sinned against is not a status that Paul assigns to himself or to us. Now, let me just be quick to say that doesn't mean you can't be sinned against. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But here's Paul's fundamental status as somebody who is deeply and profoundly sinned against. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Okay, so that's statement number one. I am my own biggest problem. Now the second statement, statement number two is, while sin is my biggest problem, it's not my only problem. And what I want to say about this is that most people enter marriage without a way of seeing their spouse as a whole person. Sometimes it's just an issue of kind of new love, you know. Like I, I remember when Kim and I first met and I got to know her and I, I, we were probably three months in a relationship and I kind of felt like I knew everything about her. You know, there's something about new love that imagines that the clock of, of, of your spouse's or your intended's existence starts right there, like the clock just started. Or sometimes when we, we, we move into relationship, we move into engagement, we move into marriage, we, we tend to see each other in, in just oversimplified ways. That's kind of where I was. She's a sinner, I'm a saint. You know, we've got these two categories. We sin and righteousness, and we work within those two categories. But, but part of what marriage is, is, is marriage is this, this invitation from God to fully know another human being through their whole story. And it doesn't mean that we ignore sin. It, it, it does mean that we never reduce people down to their patterns of sin. But it means that we have to understand what it looks like to be kind of holistic in our understanding of, of our spouse. And that leads me to telling you about a day where I was sitting in a, in a room with a group of people that are in the counseling world, and, and there was a man named David Pollison sitting there. David Pollison at that time was the president of a Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, CCEF. And, you know, it was in the afternoon. Everybody had just had lunch, and, and, and enthusiasm was lagging, and it was kind of like I remember being very sleepy. And somebody asked David Pollison, they said, could you give us a quick overview of of how you view personhood, of how you view like human motivation. So, so David jumped up and he grabbed, he grabbed a, a marker and went to a whiteboard and he drew a circle. And these circles are going to be up on the, on the screens. And he said, Scripture, and, and he wrote in the circle, the human heart. And he said, Scripture centers the human heart at the core of who we are and why we do what we do. He, Proverbs chapter 4, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 6, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the heart is presented to us in many places throughout the Old and New Testament as something that is active, as something that is worshiping, that is reaching, that is always seeking to fix its affections on something. It's always seeking to worship something. And in Genesis 3, we were just talking about Genesis 3, the heart, the heart is kind of portrayed as, as like a sponge where where the human heart in Genesis 3 is plunged into the bucket of original sin, and sin fills the heart. And so circumstances come along, parenting comes along, marriage comes along, weakness comes along, and it squeezes the sponge, and what's in the heart comes out of the heart. So when, 
you know, when you get angry because there's a pile of clothes that maybe, whether you're a husband or wife, you've folded, you've put them on the steps, but your spouse comes along, rather than carrying them up the steps, they hurdle the clothes, and when hurdling the clothes, they kick the clothes, the clothes fall down the steps, and you have things coming out of your heart that you haven't thought about or said since you were a teenager. There is an anger, or, or, or your spouse makes a a cutting comment to you in some way. What, what's happening there? Are they, are they making you sin? Are they putting temptations in you? No, they're simply squeezing the heart. Those circumstances squeeze the heart, and what's in the heart comes out of the heart. Life squeezes the sponge. Now, for some couples, change and being human is exclusively about the role of the heart. And, and, and life is just about talking about the heart. So you trace behavior to the heart, the heart to a passage, passage to repentance, repentance to change. And people, people are like hearts on a stick. And we just have to go after the heart and they'll change. And so David Powelson saying this, he's drawing that first circle, and I said, yeah, well, okay, I've been in biblical counseling, I've heard that for a number of years. And then he says, but that's not the only thing, and he draws a second circle, and he says, he says, the heart, you have to remember, is physically embodied. It's in a frame that is decaying. We're aging. We have weaknesses. You know, I, I, I go out of Starbucks the other day, I, I walk up to my car, I'm doing the thing with my fob, it won't open. I walk around the other side of the car, it won't open. I'm thinking, this is crazy. I just put a new battery in the key. I'm doing it, I'm doing it. I'm, do I'm thinking, yeah, okay, I gotta spend the rest of the day now going and finding, a, my, getting a new battery, figuring out what's wrong with the fob. I turn around, I go to walk out of the parking lot. There's my car, parked on the other side of the parking lot, yeah. We're aging, there's weakness imperfections, but it's not just that. There's, there's chemistry, isn't there? There's biology. There's menopause. There's, there's autism. There's depression. There, there are these things, you know, where, where we, are, we realize we're physically embodied. I mean, take a spouse and remove three nights of sleep from them and then inflict four children upon them or invite them to pay the bills or do something, you know, like that. And you're going to see all manner of fireworks. Now, the, a rational person doesn't say, okay, well, what you should do there is you should rush in and address the sin that you see because there's just sin all over the place. No, I mean, the rational person understands that they need to go to bed. They need, they need to sleep because the soul is inextricably bound to the body, and the body affects the soul, and the soul affects the body. So David Powell puts his second circle up, and I'm thinking, you know, wow, that's really good. I've never seen it that way. That's really good. And he says, but that's not all. He does a third circle, and he says, but there's more. The body and the soul, heart are socially embedded. You know what I'm talking about. You, you, had, you, know, you had an abusive father. Or you grew up in poverty. Or maybe it's the opposite. You grew up with a two-parent family and it was rather you know, kind of idyllic. Or there was an addiction within your house and that one child, that one adult just seemed to dominate all the environment and suck the energy, suck the, the, uh, the air from the room. I mean, you have a wife with a history of, of being sexually abused who may be experiencing difficulty with, with sex. That, that's not unusual. What I'm saying is that the diagnosis there can't start or be reduced to just 1 Corinthians chapter 7, give your spouse her conjugal rights or your conjugal rights. See, what, what this does... Is, is what's happening with these circles is we're beginning to realize that the past exerts a powerful influence on the present. 
I'm not saying it determines the present. I'm saying it, it exerts a powerful influence. The past is not causal, but it is significant. It is not, and, and the problem is, is that there's a lot of spouses in their marriage that doesn't even believe it's significant and just relate to it like it's causal. And so they flip that whole thing around. You know, for, for some new husbands, living with your wife in an understanding way may mean that, 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 that we know that they arrive as fragile because of things in the past. They might arrive feeling damaged. The husband might arrive feeling damaged. Or maybe it's the opposite. They arrive feeling pretty self-satisfied because there's this standard in life that they think they always meet. And their inner Pharisee is on work each and every day in the marriage. And so this third category, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, okay, I've never gone there. This is really blowing my mind. He says, but there's more. And he draws a fourth circle. And he says, that being is also spiritually embattled. That was a really unusual category to be brought up when you're in a building that sits across the street from Westminster Theological Seminary. But yeah, he says, yeah, you know, Ephesians 6, we struggle not against flesh and blood. You know, we know that the devil prowls around, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That these are real biblical issues. We don't understand them all. We can't explain them all, but they're real. They're in Scripture, and we can't just dismiss them. I mean, in Acts chapter 16, there's a slave girl that practices divination. Divination is clearly a sin in the Old Testament, but Paul comes into town. What's he do? He casts out the spirit of divination. <laughs> I don't know. You know, there's nothing easy about this. He wasn't he wasn't sitting her down and doing neuthetic counseling with her. You know, there's just nothing easy about this. Here's the thing. You wade into the world of exploring human motivation, it humbles you. Because there's a lot we don't know and a lot we can't know. But there is one thing we do know. And that's where Paulison drew the final circle. And he said, but still missing from all of that, is the providence of God. That encircling all of these complexities and all of these twists and all of these turns of, of upbringing and, and bodily issues, all of that is, is, is the good purposes of God and the providence of God. That he who causes all things to work together for good, who loves us because we're called according to his purposes, so he allows Job to be embattled by Satan, to be afflicted in the body, and still, you fast forward to the end of the book of Job, and it's basically God saying, and Job realizing, it's all from God. It, it, I must trust God. Actually, an even better illustration would be Joseph. I mean, Joseph is the object of one of the most dysfunctional families. You know, with an enabling father, whose love for Joseph is evident to all of the other brothers, who despise him, by the way, to the degree that they'll throw him into a hole and sell him into slavery because they decide that selling him into slavery is better than killing him. Fast forward to the end of the book of Genesis. This is Joseph's conclusion. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. In the circle so all of the things that happened to Joseph, the weird family stuff, the stuff that happened to his body, the stuff that happened to his mind, you meant it for evil. The final circle, God meant it for good. So he, here's the goal in this. And, and then I want to wrap up. The, here's the goal in this. One of the things that a diagram like this does for us is it helps us to understand each other better. And what, where we want to get to is where we are able to understand and explore those outer circles of being physically embodied, socially embedded, and spiritually embattled. Explore the outer circles without becoming intoxicated by the outer circles, without becoming distracted by the outer circles. And I say that because, honestly, there's a lot of counseling and a lot of preaching even that spends all of their time on those middle circles, on physically embodied, socially embedded, spiritually embattled. 
And, and what it does is it creates married couples who are unable to access their agency because they only can ever see themselves through those middle circles, spiritually embattled, socially embedded, physically embodied. Their explanations of their own humanity never goes further than those three circles, and they get that fortified in the counseling room or fortified through the preaching they, they sit under. Here's the thing about this diagram that we have to recognize. Those middle circles, those inner circles are never disconnected from the human heart. There's a reason why the human heart is in the middle. And, and, and there are a few tactics that the enemy loves more than to lock us up in those outer circles without any reference at all to the middle circles. Because what that does is it delivers us to that place of being sinned against. Those three outer circles, absent the inner circle of the human heart, are, are you following this? Okay, because I'm not sure I am. Uh, <laughs> those outer circles detached from that human heart circle will only ever deliver us to the status of being sinned against. We must incorporate the human heart, incorporate that center circle because that center circle links us to the sinfulness of sin. Absent that middle circle of the human heart, we feel empowered by our bitterness. We feel empowered by our anger or our lust or our slander because there's no culpability. There's no conviction. We have no grid for understanding things like forbearance and long, long suffering and mercy because all of those things are about how we respond when we feel sinned against which we're going to talk about a little bit in the next session so the beauty of the outer circles is they'll help to cultivate the knowing that will deepen our relationship with each other that will help us sympathize more with our spouse It'll spawn compassion. It'll incite service. It'll incite faith towards God. But it's the inner circle, it's the human heart that brings the agency. It's the human heart that brings the conviction. It's the human heart that substantiates the need for a savior. And we've got to train people to appreciate the complexity of their problems without ever losing sight of that middle circle without ever losing sight of why we needed a savior and honestly, why we still need one every day. So, the ultimate point of this passage and the ultimate point of this first session is not that sin is big. The ultimate point is that grace is amazing. In fact, it's amazing enough to save us. It's amazing enough to reconcile us. It's amazing enough to show us that our biggest remaining problem is not that we married sinners or father sinners or work with sinners or go to church with sinners. The biggest problem that we have is that we are a sinner, that we're broken in more ways than we ever know. But for that, there is a Savior who absorbed the wrath that we deserve so that we can live with the wholeness that comes by understanding and applying the gospel. And that makes Jesus bigger and more beautiful. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, it, it just seems so appropriate for us, for us to pause now and to go and, and to thank you for the gospel, the glorious gospel that acknowledges up front the depravity of our sin but loves us despite the fact that we're enemies, that pursues us in our state of rebellion, and that dies and sacrifices you, yourself for us because of your otherworldly and unbelievable love. Lord, you've then united us to our spouse and called us together to reflect the love that you have for the church. Lord, what a, what a marvelous grace you supply to us. And we pray that you would help us to experience that grace by reminding us of something from this session that we need to carry away by enriching our fellowship as we go on to the break and by working in our marriage in a way that brings you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.